This morning, as we study Galatians 4, 1 through 3, we're going to see that there was and is a worldview as far as how God rules his universe. And this issue arises because of the beliefs of the people in Asia Minor. And you can see a lot of this through the interactions that are in the book of Acts. And because of that, there was a fear of the hostile spiritual forces which they knew to exist and they believed were the cause of bad fate or many other unpleasant or undesirable situations. And they were looking for shamans, gurus, spiritists, anybody that could protect them from these hostile powers. But Paul's concern overall is that they would not go into uh, the law and try to go back and escape from darkness that way. Let me read the text. See, I had that in my notes, which I, I cannot see. So I've got my Bible. We did a memorial service for Lois Shirky yesterday, and one of her hallmarks was a Bible this size. This is the whole Bible. Lois had one of these, and she could read from hers until she was well into her 80s, nigh on to 90. Well, I'm only 62, so I guess I can't brag because I can read mine. Galatians 4, 1 through 3, Now I say, as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, although he's the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by the father. So also we, while we were children, were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. Or the Holman Christian Standard Bible says the elemental forces. I believe the new RSV says elemental spirits. These forces, the stoichia, are spiritual beings. So back to verse 1 here from the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Now I say that as long as the heir is a child, he differs in no way from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. Now here's an analogy from life. There's a young person in a household who has been appointed the heir of the estate. The father is very wealthy, and it's a huge estate. But this younger person has no access to it. So in the household here that's used as an illustration, it's really functionally no different between this heir and one of the household servants. They'd have the same function, status, and everything else. And that will not change until the time appointed by the father. So the young master, is one way to translate that, is a minor, but stands in line for a rich inheritance. Okay? And this was our status, well, outside of Christ and under the law. We may not even have known that. You wouldn't be able to look back and think about this if you weren't already converted. But the issue that Paul is addressing here in Galatia is that there are people who are looking, thinking, well, going back would actually enhance my status. If I went back and got under the law and, and did Sabbath keeping and did the food laws and the other things that Moses had provided, then I'd have better status and I could take what I have in Christ plus add this to it and things would be great. But Paul's arguing, you're going back to slavery. You're going back to uh, a situation that you don't really want to go back to. And since you've escaped from it, you're a fool. And he actually called them that. Are you so foolish that you'd ever want to go back? Now that you have already entered in to the blessing of the inheritance, at least the down payment, why would you go back? 
so that was our status outside of Christ and under the law. Galatians 4.2. Instead, he is under guardians and stewards until the time set by the Father. Now this uh, until is very, very important in our understanding of Galatians chapter 4. There is an until, there is a time that was set by the Father. You see that in verse 4 that we're not going to get to until next week, but I'm going to allude to Galatians 4.4 4 talks about the fullness of time. In the Acts 1, the disciples were saying to Jesus, now are you going to restore the kingdom to us? And he said, it's not for you to know the time that's set by the Father. Because you know that God superintends providentially the timing of everything that goes on. In particular, things that we're looking forward to, such as the second coming of Christ. So because the young master who might be thinking all of that money and all of that power is just waiting for me, if I could just get older, if I could just get to the age where I'm not a minor, then all everything would be just fantastic. And so, but he's under supervision. Somebody else is telling him what to do. The father determines who the supervisors are, and he sets the time when the arrangement ends. So in their minds, to be in that status, you once the time came, that's great. Okay, I got the money. I can go buy a brand new car. Well, they didn't have those back then. But I could enter into this status and privilege of being a wealthy man. And verse 3, this is the one I want to really focus on because it's often misunderstood. Galatians 4, 3. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were in slavery under the elemental forces of the world. Now, this term stoichia has been debated as to its meaning for a long time. But in recent decades, papyri, which were uh, a kind of paper that things were written on that were found from the ancient world, amulets, inscriptions that were, would be in stone or on uh, metal or whatever, so they survived through the many centuries, have been found to indicate that this stoichia, which also could mean the ABCs, the orderly arrangement, the ABCs of religion, or the elements which they thought to be earth, wind, fire, and water, okay, it could be the elements, or it could be the spiritual forces of darkness that were influencing the world. Now, I have argued elsewhere, particularly in this one Critical Issues commentary art, uh, article that I published, in fact, a couple of them, that this means elemental forces or spiritual forces or spirit beings. The people feared these things. And I would also say the book of Acts would argue very strongly against the idea that we're just talking about earth, wind, fire, and water. Because how would that even be pertinent? And as the gospel went into Asia Minor in Acts 13 and 14 and then later in Ephesus, we have quite a bit of material in Acts about what all happened. There was spiritual conflict that were, was very real. We had the woman of the spirit of divination. We had the sons of Sceva who wanted to cast out demonic forces, and it didn't work out so well for him. He was... Uh, they, they didn't, or for them, excuse me, the, yeah, they didn't really know God. And so <clears throat> the silversmiths that were losing their business because people were repenting of idolatry and the spiritual cataclysm and conflicts that were profound, sometimes objective, that happened in Asia Minor as recounted in the book of Acts, would certainly 
belie any concept that all we're talking about is earth, wind, fire, and water, or even just the ABCs of religion. So therefore, my claim is, and I believe that a lot of contemporary scholarship backs this up, these were spiritual forces of darkness. They were considered to be fickle, harmful, and really bad. And so he's referring to their pre-conversion state as having been in slavery. That's another issue that would help us with our interpretation. Are you in slavery to the earth, wind, fire, and water? Well, you might be if you think that these things are, are deity, but probably not. The ABCs of religion, well, yeah. If you're under false religion, you could call that slavery. But I think it's more sinister than that. They were fickle and harmful, and they were in slavery in their pre-conversion state. Coming to Christ delivered them from this. And we'll see some other evidence for it. Now, there are some Christians who are still fighting battles from 150 years ago and think that, well, you know, the modernists just discounted all miracles and all spirits and, and everything else. And somehow today we understand that these things are real. And they definitely are. I uh, turned on the news this morning as I was trying to get awake enough to actually come and preach here. And I did. I woke up. No, that's for you to judge. But I think I did. I'm feeling pretty good. And they had a spiritist doing a psychic reading of a newscaster. And if you want to think about the absurdity of this, and it really is a good chance to preach the gospel to people, her claim the fame was she said, well, your grandfather had a heart attack, and she was saying all this stuff that had to do with this guy who was a newscaster, and this and this and this. Wow, wow. Well, so what is being provided is simply information that he already knew. And the only reason for providing it, assuming the whole thing wasn't a hoax, was to make people think, wow, this person really hears from the spirits of the universe or whatever they claim gave them this psychic ability. But I wouldn't discount that as being a hoax. It may very well not be, but it's a deception from Satan. And this useless information was simply provided to give credence to this whole process, which is frankly forbidden in Scripture. We're not to have spiritists. And here's a nice, charming, uh, helpful lady being a tool of Satan, in my opinion, she would deny that, in giving this information to put people into bondage. Now, these Galatian Christians in their pre-conversion estate, estate were under all of this. They believed in it. They spent a lot of money to practice their religion and so forth. Now we have implications and applications. Those who come to Christ find freedom from the hostile spiritual forces. Then secondly, we need to understand how God rules his universe. And third, to go back to law works is to put oneself back under the bondage that God has freed us from. Let me make a comment here. A little over a year ago, I landed in the hospital actually uh, with the condition that I have that they're, that they're treating now, but it was really bad and almost killed me. I landed in the hospital. But even then, I'd been studying this material. <clears throat> and when I was laying in the hospital, when I first got there, Eric called. And I don't know if you you probably remember this, Eric. I was so taken with why, that this whole Galatians and this paradigm and how this works that I was concerned about that more than whether I lived or died. I wanted to live so I could preach this. 
And I said, Eric, do you understand the paradigm in Galatians? The implication is you're going to have to teach it if I die. (laughs) Because I think this is important. And it's burning in my heart to share the material that we have in Colossians, Ephesians, Galatians, all places in Asia Minor. And it dawned on me not that long before, again, this um, unknown, previously unknown disease had run so far in its course that it almost killed me. I was thinking about that, and it suddenly dawned on me that the stakes are raised. This is a bigger deal than we thought. So here's a Christian who says, I think I should keep the Jewish food laws. Uh, I think I must keep the Jewish Sabbath. Well, okay, that's an idea. We'll discuss the idea. Maybe it's not a good idea or whatever. No, this isn't just an idea. This is putting yourself under the demons. And when you put yourself there, they will beat you. They will torment you in some regard. And you won't find it so easy to get free. Now, can we even think like that? Well, I remember my pre-conversion estate. I was angry and uh, hostile to the gospel for no apparent reason. I was this young man in chemical engineering. I had no reason to suddenly get hostile and blasphemous because I was confronted with the gospel of Christianity. But I did. I was under bondage that I didn't even fully understand. Ephesians 1.11. Let's look at this carefully. I'm using the Net Bible here. And those of you who have the Net Bible, if you follow the footnotes in some of these verses that I'm going to reference, you'll, you'll find some really good material there in the Net Bible. It says in Ephesians 1.11... In Christ, we too have been claimed as God's own possession since we were predestined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to the counsel of his will. Now, I spent a lot of time, like I said, over a year ago, looking at this verse 11. And... Some translations say we have an inheritance. Here it has, says we've been claimed as God's inheritance. And I did a lot of study on that, and I found some good evidence that claimed as God's own possession is the correct translation, and it fits with a biblical worldview. And I want to show you that this morning. And what's the difference? Well, it is absolutely true that we do have an inheritance as Christians, a spiritual one. We are heirs and joint heirs of Christ. But that's not what it's talking about here. Remember, Ephesus is in this section of Asia Minor where all of this uh, influence in spiritual warfare was prominent. You see that later in Ephesians 6 when it talks about the armor of God. So what would it mean to be claimed as God's own possession? Why would he even want us? Well, this goes back to the Old Testament, and we're going to look at that in Deuteronomy 32 and verse 9. God's purpose is to have his own people over whom he rules who are not under the hostile powers and the same slavery that we were under before, but will be directly the Lord's people. And when it talks about predestination, very interesting term. Um, some years ago, I was asked to debate a theologian by the name of Greg Boyd on the topic of predestination. Now, this was through the sponsorship of a radio station, and I think that radio stations like to get as controversial as they can so they can get people to come out and get mad at somebody. And it's amazing how many Christians are absolutely livid if they even hear the idea of predestination. 
And when you point out that, well, I didn't make this up, here it is. It was, look at it. It says it there. I didn't make that up. It doesn't satisfy them at all. They're still mad. There can't be any such thing. God is waiting to watch and see what we do, and then from there he'll figure out what's going to happen. Well, that's decidedly not what this text says. And so what I decided to do in my debate was just put up a, some Bible verses and carefully explain the Scripture and don't go into philosophy. Well, the fellow I debated was going into all kinds of philosophical considerations, one after another after another. I don't blame him. He had two PhDs, wrote 14 books, and I was just this little nobody. So I just stuck with the Scripture because I had that. And what we don't realize is this is not here just to make us fatalist or hopeless, but to comfort us. If you lived, excuse me, if you lived in Asia Minor during the time when Paul was preaching there, your life in, in your own mind was hanging in the balance all the time. Bad fate was just around the corner. People like Simon Magus, the curse guy, the magician, were around and they, were, they feared bad fate. They feared being under curses. They feared that the gods were unhappy with them. They had no direct revelation from God because they didn't have the scripture. And now under the preaching of Paul, and the others, they become Christian. To be told by, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that they were claimed as God's position and predestined didn't start a philosophical debate. It was supposed to give them comfort. In other words, Asian Christians or Asia Minor Christians, you're safe. Nobody will pluck you from God's hands. Your uh, future is not hanging by the stars or the fate of the spiritists or whatever, but in the hands of God, and you're his. And you should put on the armor of God, which is not a series of incantations, but it's the gospel itself. And so Paul is saying, you're safe here, so why do you want to go back? Why go back to slavery? Why go back to the state you were in before? when you were no different than a slave, though you were an heir? Why go back under the stoichia and the demons when you're already free, you're predestined, that's not going to be your future? <clears throat> now, the means that God uses is gospel preaching, which you see in Ephesians 1.13. Now, let's go back to Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9, in order to see the background for this idea of having been claimed as God's own possession. Now this was after Genesis 10, the table of nations, and how God um, established that there would be nations and kings and what have you. But here is a comment on that, and I'm using the ESV uh, version of the Bible. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. But the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted heritage. Now, verse 9, the last sentence there, but the Lord's portion, is... Uh, I believe, referenced or alluded to in Ephesians 1.11. We're the Lord's portion. We're his people. Providentially, he directly cares for us. Yes, we're under human rulers like everybody else, but we're not under the demonic forces of the universe. Now, there's a dispute about the reading here because the Masoretic text, which is from 950 A.D., has according to the number of the sons of Israel. Again, if you have the Net Bible, follow the footnotes and you'll get some good material on this. 
the much older reading that's attested by the Septuagint, which was the Greek Old Testament, and material found with the Dead Sea Scrolls, which also would be much older than the Masoretic text, have sons of God or angels of God. I believe that's the correct reading, and it's keeping with many other passages in the Old Testament, some of which we'll look at. And so the idea is the pagan nations who do not know God and do not serve God are apportioned according to this, the sons of God. And we'll see that this includes evil forces as well as good ones. And by God's grace, there are human kings and leaders that are between us and any of these forces of darkness that are out there in the universe. And so, as bad as some of our politicians may seem to us, they're actually better than the demons. Is that shocking? <laughs> okay, never mind. <laughs> it could be worse. And frankly, will be during the tribulation. So if we are the Lord's, and we believe the gospel, we, we are God's inheritance, through, and we are so through faith. Otherwise, we're under these spiritual powers. And so this had to be very real and understood by the Christians in Asia Minor, especially Galatia, because Paul said that if they go back, if they reject the claims of the gospel that they claim to believe, they'll be right back under these. And it'll be very bad. It's called slavery in Galatians. Now, Acts 7.42, I think, is very important. Some years ago, maybe three or four, not really long time ago, I was teaching the Ten Commandments from Exodus, and I was also referencing Ten Commandments as listed in Deuteronomy, and I ran across this phrase, the host of heaven, as being forbidden in Deuteronomy. And I did a search for that on it and began to study that, and I realized the host of heaven are not just the stars, the moon, the heavenly bodies, but they're actual, in many cases, spiritual beings that were hostile. And I'll prove that to you as we go along here. It says in Acts 7.42, this is Stephen's speech that's recounted in the book of Acts, Acts 7.42, but God turned away and delivered them up to the serve the host of heaven. As it is written in the book of the prophets, it was not to me that you offered victims and sacrifices 40 years in the wilderness, was it, O house of Israel? Well, if you remember the narrative of the wilderness wandering, one of the first things that happened was when Moses went on Mount Sinai, they made the golden calf. And they said, this is your God that brought you out of Egypt. And so they resorted to idolatry. Now notice how, excuse me, notice how Stephen says this. God turned away and delivered them up to serve the host of heaven because they rejected God. Now go back to Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9. All of the nations are put a portion under other forces, sons of God, but Israel is the Lord's. Yahweh would rule over Israel. And if they served him, they would have this blessing and this benevolent rule of the creator of the universe, God himself. But when they rebelled against Yahweh and didn't want him to rule over them and went over to the host of heaven, they ended up in the same sorry state as the pagans. And that's exactly what Stephen's reminding them of. You didn't want Yahweh to rule over you. And you went into idolatry and you worshipped other gods, so God turned you over to the host of heaven. And what do the host of heaven do? They beat you. 
and it's been a miserable situation to be in slavery to the stoichia, or another way of saying this, the host of heaven. This doesn't mean actual stars and moons and, you know, and terrestrial bodies did anything. It's that there's a spiritual darkness that's called the host of heaven. And so that was the state they were in, whether they were Jewish or Gentile, as the apostles preached in the book of Acts. Now let's look at another reference to the host of heaven. Again, another way of discussing these beings that are also called stoichia. This is in 1 Kings 22, 19 through 21. I'm citing from the New American Standard. Micaiah, let me give you the background here. Um, there were 400 prophets telling Ahab that he should go forth into battle and he was going to prevail. And Ahab said, is that it, the 400? Is that all we got? Well, there's this other guy over here, I'm paraphrasing, Micaiah. I wouldn't ask him. He never has anything positive to say. You ever know somebody like that? They, they tell you the truth. You know, people want to flatter other people, especially kings, so they just tell them what they want to hear. But here's the one that tells them the truth. Now, let's, let's, what about this Micaiah? Well, here, in this case, God pulls back the veil so we can sort of see behind the scenes to the heavenly council how this all came to be. And why they listened, why they had these 400 false prophets. And Micaiah said, Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing by him. Here's that phrase again, the host of heaven, that Stephen talked about. On his right and on his left. And the Lord said, Who will entice Ahab to go up and fall at Ramoth? Gilead. And one said this, while another said that. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. Then it goes on to say, well, how? Well, I'll be a lying spirit in the mouth of his prophets. So here, in this host of heaven, there's a lying spirit. This can't be a good angel, can it? Good angels aren't lying spirits. This is the wicked angel or a wicked son of God here, as they're called. Um, and part of the host of heaven. And so here we have this pulling back of the veil. It's very rare, but you do see it in Scripture. You see it in the book of Job. Norman Geisler calls it on the scene, behind the scene, and beyond the scene. And Job is like that. It opens up and lets us see things that we wouldn't otherwise notice because we're just looking on the scene. On the scene, 400 prophets are telling him, go and prevail. Well, he's defeated. Behind the scene is the heavenly council, the host of heaven, with the lying spirit. Now, there's also uh, Job 1 and verse 6 where Satan comes with the sons of God before God. Okay, and there's this discussion about Job and why he serves God, and you probably know the book of Job. Now let's go back to Galatians 4 and have a little preview for next week. Galatians 4, 7, and 8. Back to these people who are tempted to go back to circumcision, Sabbath-keeping, food laws, whatever is offered in the law, and Paul's rebuking them for it. And we've put this in context many times. Now, just looking ahead a little bit, Galatians 4, 7 and 8. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. Now, here is the young master, heir of all, not old enough, can't do what he'd like to do. He, he doesn't have the status or the privilege. But that changed at the appointed time, Galatians 4, 4, when Christ is sent, now a son. And then he says, and if a son, then an heir through God. Now we receive this glorious inheritance and the privileged status of being sons. 
However, Paul says, at that time, now going back before, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those which by nature are no gods. Now it was in Deuteronomy 32. Later in that uh, chapter, it says those who worship idols worship demons. It says that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. The ones who worship idols worship demons. The idol is just a chunk of wood, clay, silver. If you want a really good one, you can get gold, which all could be melted down or whatever. But behind the idolatry is a demonic religion that the Bible treats as real. Those who worship idols worship demons. It says that in the old and in the new. So when you're slaves to those which are by nature are no gods, we're talking about the demonic realm and the power now working in the sons of disobedience, as it says in the book of Ephesians. <clears throat> yeah, I have embedded in this PowerPoint all kinds of notes that I could be referencing if it worked right. So I think I'm telling you the truth from my mind. But if there's anything wrong, I plead innocent. But I think we got this right. So I'm just alluding to things that I wish I could quote. Now let's go now to the gospel. So if you look at this situation, okay, here are the Galatian Christians who are free in Christ. If Christ has set us free. We now are heirs, no longer slaves in the household. We've been delivered from the stoichia, the hostile powers of darkness. We have God himself ruling over us. That's the key issue. If you go back to Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9. The key issue is that God himself rules over his own people unless they rebel. But we don't want God ruling over us. We'd rather have circumcision. We don't want God ruling over us. We'd rather have the food laws. We'd rather go back to the synagogue. We'd rather do the uh, old covenant material. Forgetting that all that did was lead them to the host of heaven. As Stephen said, God turned them over to the host of heaven. Well, if we just had our own kind of leadership, well, I told you before, and not that long before Christ came to the earth, they had wicked Jewish leadership that crucified hundreds of Jewish men in the most cruel fashion you could think. They were under the host of heaven. They weren't under Yahweh. They'd rebelled against him. And so here we are now. We either serve the Lord through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ by his terms or we go back to slavery and we don't uh, fully grasp how bad the slavery is we think it's not so bad we think if we enhance the rule of Christ with some Jewish laws or maybe some material gleaned from the pagan culture it'll be better the, the, the two added together will be a better thing than just serving God on his terms. That is a lie. We must not go elsewhere, and I'll show you why here from Matthew. Matthew 11, 20 through 30. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This is what Jesus said this. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is what Jesus said. So here we have people that are under the thumbs of the religious rulers and leaders. Jump. Okay, that wasn't high enough. Jump higher. No, that wasn't high enough. Lengthen your phylacteries. Serve us. Do this, do that, do this, do that. Read Matthew 23. 
It's never enough. Once somebody rules over you, be it a blackmailer or a religious leader or somebody else that's convinced you that you must do everything they say, there's no end to it. It says in Matthew 23 that they tie up heavy burdens and lay them on men's shoulders and they will not lift them with so much as a finger. I'm not going to do any of this. It's for you to be under this bondage. I'm the leader. You're the servant. You do what I say there. And when you get done doing everything I said, I'll, I'll think of something else to make you miserable. Who'd sign up for that? Well, Israel was signed up for that. And in the midst of that, Jesus comes. People don't understand this passage in Matthew because right at the it's the very end of Matthew 11, the next chapter, Matthew 12, is a series of Sabbath controversies. Jesus and his disciples are accused of being Sabbath breakers. In other words, they weren't bearing the yoke. So Jesus comes into this situation of the religious leaders creating the yoke of bondage, laying it on the shoulders of people who are weighed down in misery because of it. And Jesus comes and announces to all who will listen, take my yoke, uh, I will give you rest. Rest here means Sabbath rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I'm gentle and humble. The total opposite of the religious leaders. Rest for your soul. They had no such thing to offer. They only had more works. My yoke is easy. Theirs was, and it was very onerous and hard, and you never got out from under it. And they would go to great length, the rabbis would, as they would have Mishnah and later Talmud, what's defined as work. This, 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 you can't do on Sabbath. To the point where you can't even, it's almost hopeless. According to Galatians, okay, fly, you're going to die. Well, I did, I, it just bugged me. I got a fly on my PowerPoint. According to Galatians, it's slavery. It's absolute slavery. You serve, you serve, you serve, you serve, you serve. When you get done, well, there's nothing for you. There's no hope. Let me tell you about the rest that Jesus offers I've preached many times, and I was able to do so again yesterday at this memorial service in Wisconsin, that Jesus Christ existed as God and with God from all eternity. He came into this world, born of a virgin, and lived a sinless life. When he was teaching here, Matthew 11, he'd done many works and signs that would indicate he truly is the Messiah. He's the promised one. And he did not come to make a heavy burden heavier. He came to bear all burdens, the weight of sin, even the sins of the world. He came to die for sins, the just for the unjust, in order to bring us to God. And when he's offering his yoke, his, like being under a yoke of oxen that have to pull a heavy burden, he's offering his benevolent Lordship, where he loves us, cares for us, and only teaches what's in our best interest, not that of the religious rulers who would like to preempt it. Jesus Christ uniquely predicted his own resurrection from the dead. Christian claim depends on this being true. He really was raised from the dead. Before many witnesses, the tomb was empty. They all agreed that it was. They just disputed why, because they didn't want to submit to Christ. But it says here that he would teach, that he's gentle, humble in heart, and we'll find rest for our souls. Our souls are troubled by sin, hopelessness, darkness, serving, 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 with no certainty that any of it is to any good end. 
And so Sabbath rest, as found in Christ, is not a bunch of heavy burdens about Sabbath keeping. Jesus, in the midst of all this, said man was created for, or Sabbath was created for man, not man for the Sabbath. Let's see how many burdens we can put on everybody to the point where Sabbath is the worst day of the whole week. You got more work to try to not work than you would if you just worked. This was rebuked in the New Testament, and shame on those who want to reinstitute this for Christians. Shame on them. They're in rebellion against God, and they're going to have to answer to Christ for treating his flock in such a horrible way. Yes, we come and we worship, but if you look in the book of Hebrews, Sabbath rest is found in Messianic salvation. It's an eternal rest. It's not a rest from Friday at sundown to Saturday at sundown. It's a rest that goes on, it starts now, and it goes on continually for all eternity. There remaineth therefore a rest for the people of God. Jesus, who was crucified, died for sins, was buried, raised on the third day, and bodily ascended into heaven, has called us to repent and believe the gospel. We are lost, we are in slavery, all these things I've been talking about can all be removed as we're transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the Son of his love. That's what it says in Colossians. Whose yoke are you under? Are you under the yoke of religious works? Are you under the yoke of sin and slavery? Are you under the yoke of the the demonic, which rules over lost minds, or have you taken upon yourself, by God's grace, through faith, take my yoke upon you, says the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's look at one more slide. There's an either or here. Galatians 5.1. I'm doing a little preview. We'll get to this eventually. Galatians 5.1 says, It was for freedom that Christ set us free, Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. I wrote an article refuting a mystic whose main claim was that Jesus' yoke is spiritual disciplines and in particular going out into solitude and silence. And there, in this solitude and silence, one finds the kingdom of God. So in my article, I wrote what I'm preaching to you today. I just went through the passages. What did Jesus say? What was the issue? How did they understand the yoke? How does Paul understand the yoke? And that the yoke is the believing the gospel and finding rest through messianic salvation. I gave all of this evidence. A friend of mine called the guy who wrote the book, famous mystic, evangelical mystic, which is an oxymoron, and uh, we don't, yeah, we hear that kind of stuff. We don't take it seriously. It doesn't matter what the scripture says. We're going to teach what we're going to teach, and we've got all these followers, and we have a big name, and we sell many books. Why don't we listen to anybody with biblical evidence? It's not worth our time. That's the answer we got. And thousands of Christian young people go to Bible colleges and seminaries and are taught the lies and the abuses of these kindly old gentlemen. Beware kindly old gentleman bearing false teaching. Freedom, Christ set us free. If we go back, we're just going to be subject again to the yoke of slavery. That, to me, it shouldn't be so revolutionary, but it was. Over a year ago, studying Galatians, I realized that this isn't just a dispute about whether Christians ought to or ought not to keep the Jewish laws. This is about whether you're going to serve demons, stoichia, or whether you're going to serve Christ. That's what it's about. The stakes are raised. Paul wasn't just being 
uh, somebody using exaggeration and hyperbole. Who seduced you? You fools. Cursed. Under the pedagogue. Under managers. Under supervisors. Under the yoke of bondage. Under all of these things. Is that what you want? Is that where you're going? After you receive the gospel, you're going to jettison eternal Sabbath rest for law-keeping? What's the attraction? It's like a magnet. People want to follow works. They believe that I have to do something. I've got to add to it. It's not enough what God did for me. Huge attraction. Anytime somebody hangs out a shingle and offers works, they'll find a crowd. I never could figure that out. You could just be an ordinary pagan and just stay home and watch the Vikings. I tried that last week. I didn't stay home, but when I got home, I turned on the Vikings. What a way to get a Sunday nap. <laughs> well, I'll let you decide whether that sure seemed that way to me. It was slow motion. Who are you going to serve? Are you going to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, whose yoke is easy, whose burden is light, who cares about us, who loves us, and will receive us into glory? Or are we going to serve the religious leaders who want to hi- uh, pile up bundles of burdens and lay them on us and tell us that will make us closer to God? You decide. Who are you going to serve? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending Jesus Christ at the fullness of time to deliver us from the yoke of bondage. And we love our Lord, and we thank you that we've been privileged to see these things and pray that we would not be tempted to go back to some man-made system. Help us continue to always trust you. In Jesus' name. Amen.